So, committee, first of all, welcome everyone before we get started. We'll do an official welcome, Secretary Song first. Um, everybody good? Everybody good? Everybody has a seat? All right, I think we might as well get started unless people object. What we're going to do, Secretary Saunders, I'm going to do a quick welcome. We'll introduce ourselves as a committee after that so everybody knows who we are. Turn it over to you and then we'll have questions. Okay, great. Great. Get my glasses on. Great. Thank you, Morgan. Welcome, everyone, to Senate Education. It is. Everyone, comment to Senate Education, oh. period. Mm -hmm. Just a little technical difficulty, but we'll mm -hmm. get through it. How's that? Good? Okay. I want to begin with a very warm welcome to Secretary Zoe Saunders. We're pleased to have you with us this afternoon. As you know, this is an opportunity for the Senate Education Committee to consider your appointment as Vermont's Secretary of Education. It also serves an opportunity for our legislative colleagues and Vermonters across the state to get to know you better, as well as an opportunity for you to get to know us. We've received a lot of emails about process, so let me just say a few words. Uh, unlike other cabinet level positions where the governor makes appointments himself, the State Board of Education oversees the search process for the Secretary of Education. The State Board is an 11 member citizen board appointed by the governor each serving a term of six years and shall not be eligible for reappointment for successive terms. Just to give some people some background about that group. So this search process was initiated when the State Board received a letter from Governor Scott to the State Board of Education on June 26, 2023. And the letter is in Senator's folders and available online. In fact, all the testimony, if anybody's interested, is completely available online. Following receipt of this, three members of the State Board of Education, Jennifer Samuelson, Lyle Jepson, and Jenna O'Farrell, served on the search committee for the new Secretary of Education. The search committee began its process by having opportunities for public comment at each of their 11 committee meetings. And they also held a public hearing for members of the public to express their thoughts and opinions on the desired qualities and attributes of the next Secretary of Education. The State Board synthesized the information they learned from all public comment received, integrating it with the requirements set forth in statute, as well as the educational priorities outlined in Governor Scott's July 26, 2023 letter launching the search for the Secretary of Education. Collaborating with the Offices of Human Resources and the Office of Racial Equity, they crafted a job description to advertise the opening upon receipt of 19 applicants. More applicants, I should mention, we learned on Friday uh, for this round than either of the past two searches received. The State Board reviewed applications, interviewed candidates, and forwarded three names to the governor, which the governor chose Secretary Saunders. It's now up to us, the Senate Education Committee, to interview Se Secretary Saunders and make a recommendation to the full Senate. If confirmed by the full Senate, Secretary Saunders will be up for reappointment and reconfirmation this coming February 2025. And Secretary Saunders, I have one final comment that really for you. I think we all know, and you certainly know, that your nomination has garnered a tremendous amount of interest. And I would be remiss if I were not to say that we come to this hearing at a moment in our nation's history where divisiveness is at an all-time high and our democracy is under threat. And democracy is about process, and this hearing is an essential part of that process. Dismissing someone prior to such a process is not only disconcerting to me, it is also disconcerting to many Vermonters. So I want to assure you that we are here to provide you with a fair, respectful, thoughtful, and comprehensive hearing this afternoon. Thank you. So with that, we'll go around the room, introduce ourselves, and then turn it over to you. Excellent. Senator Williams. Senator Terry Williams, representing Rutland County from Pullman. Senator. Dave Weeks from Proctor, representing Rutland County. Brian Campion, Bennington County. 
Martina Rock-Uerk. I live in Burlington and represent Chittenden Central, which is Winooski, Burlington, Essex, and Colchester. Hi, Nader Hashim from Wyndham County. So, your introductory comments, any thoughts you may have, I'm sure they're better than what I just put out in terms of interest, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Campion and uh, Education Committee members for having me here today. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to discuss my professional background and how my skills will help to elevate public school and public education in the state of Vermont. Additionally, I'm excited uh, to share with you my motivation uh, for being your next Secretary of Education um, and how my first week on the job um, has strengthened my dedication uh, to fulfilling this crucial role. My passion for education has been shaped by my rural roots and family deeply ingrained in the values of collective advocacy and engagement. This upbringing has profoundly shaped my view of education as a means of fostering equity, inclusion, and opportunities for all students. Professionally, I chose a career that afforded me a broad view of education and an understanding of the many factors that contribute to student success. Over nearly two decades of education leadership, I have focused on developing a shared vision for a more just and inclusive future where all students have access to a great public school. A pivotal moment in my educational journey occurred while I was an undergraduate student at Harvard University. During my college years, I tutored in an after-school and summer program in a Boston neighborhood plagued by historic rates of gun violence. Witnessing the trauma these children brought to school highlighted for me the critical importance of context in educational programming. Meeting with parents and education activists underscored the vital role of community engagement in developing educational opportunities that are tailored to meet the needs of the whole child. This experience led me to begin my professional career in the nonprofit sector, where I provided wraparound support to children with developmental de delays, chronic health conditions, and HIV AIDS. I gained valuable insights into the broader health and social emotional needs that students bring to the classroom. Motivated by these experiences, I pursued a Master of Education degree at Vanderbilt University's Peabody School of Education to develop expertise in creating comprehensive systems of support spanning from cradle to career. In graduate school, I spearheaded community engagement efforts by walking door to door in the largest public housing project in Nashville, Tennessee to capture residents' educational priorities. With the community goals in hand, I work to align partner resources to increase educational services and family supports. My efforts helped secure a Promise Neighborhood Grant, which was a signature education initiative under the Obama administration. Here's what I learned from this experience. We must work together, all of us fully, to meet the needs of students so that they can thrive. I was then hired at Charter Schools USA to drive academic performance for 70,000 students across seven states and ensure a great public school for every child, regardless of family income and where they lived. My tenure at Charter Schools USA gave me a national perspective on public education and honed my skills in driving school performance <clears throat> improvement. Working closely with principals and teachers in high poverty, high minority communities, I facilitated school improvement planning and developed tools and systems to sustain performance year over year. I also gained broad strategic and operational experience in grants management, accreditation, budgeting, program adoption, and board reporting. One of my proudest achievements was that every child received a per personalized learning plan that supported their academic success from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Our number of A and B schools doubled within two years and achievement scores increased an average of 41%. I led this work across multiple states involving many state superintendents, principals, curriculum specialists, and teachers, and had to adhere to different laws, state laws, and requirements. This experience is very relevant to the ethos of local control in the state of Vermont. 
Subsequently, I was hired as the first chief education officer for the city of Fort Lauderdale in Florida. In this role, I focused on supporting the most underserved schools within one of the nation's largest public school districts. I focused on, um, and this role enabled me to engage the community. And in doing that, I analyzed the data and advocated for changes that resulted in millions of dollars of improvements to public school facilities and new extended learning programs. Additionally, I worked to address critical job shortages by launching new technical training programs. I developed an aviation program to fill critical mechanic vacancies and a public works program to develop a talent pipeline to support climate resiliency. Under my leadership, the city earned several awards, including from Broward County Public Schools, the National League of Cities, and the US Department of Labor under the Biden administration. Thereafter, I joined Broward County Public Schools, the sixth largest school district in the country, serving over 200,000 students. As the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer, I developed a participatory approach to redefine district operations with the goal of better meeting the needs of students. As a district faced significant under-enrollment, part of my job was to develop strategies to increase demand in public schools. I'm here because I believe in the power of public education. As a mom of two school-aged children who will be entering Vermont's public schools, I take the responsibility of leading the agency of education very seriously. My decision to move to Vermont is also deeply personal because it allows me to be closer to family. I'm excited for my children to live near their aunts, uncles, and cousins who already live here in Vermont and for them to grow up in such a wonderful place. I believe my role as a Secretary of Education is to listen, learn, and lead the state to achieve our collective goals. I applied for the job because I want to support Vermont's efforts to create a continuum where early childhood services seamlessly lead to kindergarten readiness and a smooth transition to K-12. And K-12 is aligned with higher education, training, and career opportunities. Research shows having this type of system is a driver of social mobility and economic prosperity, not to mention the positive impact on social determinants of health and prevention. I've devoted my life to promoting integrated educational services from early childhood to workforce training. A key skill that I bring is the ability to break down silos, to create a continuum of education and wraparound supports targeting students' needs. Over the past week, I have had the great privilege of traveling across the state to familiarize myself with the education landscape. These visits are helping me to develop a listen and learn tour, which will hopefully promote broad-based engagement. I've also met with all superintendents, the State Board of Education, Chambers of Commerce, and the community. Additionally, I've enjoyed meeting with agency staff who are enthusiastic about their work and excited to support the future of education in Vermont. I've heard a few key themes in my first week on the job that I'd like to share with you. First, there seems to be a great interest in developing a unifying vision for the future of education in Vermont. This has been an overarching theme, touching on issues of education finance, education quality, enrollment, facilities, and workforce development. Second, there are questions about how we can balance Vermont's ethos and motto of unity and freedom as we strive to achieve shared educational goals while celebrating local control and customization. Third, the issue of mental health has emerged as we grapple with ways to meet students' expanding needs. Finally, all these conversations require us to think strategically about how to finance our education system, ensuring that we are providing equitable learning opportunities for every student. Spending time in the field has also reaffirmed my belief in the strength of Vermont's education system. I am proud of our emphasis on personalized learning, community engagement, and inclusionary practices. I had the opportunity to meet with students and was extraordinarily impressed um, by the students' ability to think um, analytically about very complex issues and also their sincere desire to make a difference in their communities. 
I was also impressed by teachers' passion for their students and enjoyed seeing how they engage their students meaningfully in their content. Additionally, from principals and superintendents, I felt their genuine desire and relentless effort to give our students more educational opportunities. I understand that this is a challenging time and, then, and know that the work ahead of me will not be easy. I recognize that educators have been asked to do more and more over the past five years while navigating challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and now face difficult budget decisions that I know must be incredibly stressful and emotionally draining to consider. However, I trust that together we will build upon the strengths of our community and each other. I believe in public education and I believe in Vermont. I'm excited for this opportunity and look forward to engaging in deeper conversations about how we can build an even brighter future for Vermont students. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And I'll start with a question uh, and then open it up to the committee. I know uh, senators uh, I'm sure have a number of different questions. So one of the things I'm interested in knowing, Secretary Saunders, is uh, you've talked about this a little bit, but your devotion to public education. If we were to uh, turn to someone and say, here are some examples of how Secretary Saunders has, has demonstrated historically that devotion to public education, what might be a couple of things that we might point to? Yeah. So I've spent nearly uh, two decades um, promoting public education. Um, I think I want to clarify, too, that in every state that I've worked, um, charter schools are public schools. Um, and so I was able to support um, and really focusing on driving school um, performance improvement um, and working closely with principals and teachers and analyzing the data and building uh, systems in place uh, to support um, student success. I've also had experience in public education building strategic partnerships that have helped to enrich uh, the programmatic opportunities and really be able to leverage um, the collective resources to better serve students. Additionally, in public education, I've worked to close the service gaps and have had um, the opportunity to build extended learning opportunities both after school and summer uh, to provide those additional, additional time um, and intensive support um, for those students that are struggling academically. And just to follow up, charter schools, the term is used all the time. Magnet schools, charter schools. Uh, what, can you just tell us, I, I think a charter school means different things depending on where you are. Could you just say something about sure. the charter schools in particular that you've worked in? Sure, and I also wanna mention that I'm not interested in bringing uh, charter school legislation sure. to the state of Vermont. Vermont. Um, and I know that the governor has also come on the record and indicated that as well. Um, in every state that I've worked in, charter schools are public schools, and they are defined as public schools in state statute. And what that means is the students that are enrolled in those schools are required to take the same state assessment. Uh, teachers are required to have the same um, evaluation standards. Um, what is different is the governance structure and the enrollment process. So instead of the enrollment being by the geographic boundary in which student lives, in which a student lives, it's based on a, a lottery system similar to a magnet school, which I know we have one um, in Burlington. Um, in terms of the governance structure, yes, two pathways, yes. Um, in terms of the governance structure, the board has, uh, the charter is approved by the authorizer, which is either the school district or the state, and then has another layer of a school board that oversees the accountability to the agreed upon performance metrics. Um, that board um, is able to contract with an education management company um, to support day-to-day -day operations. Um, and they are required to go before their authorizer to be able to show their results. And if they are not meeting um, the performance standards, they are subject to um, action that would, may include closure. Thank you. Committee. Senator Shane. Hi, thank you for uh, coming. And so, and I'm, I'm curious about uh, your thoughts on uh, public schools versus private schools, uh, maybe versus isn't the right word, but mm -hmm. we have a complicated ecosystem in our state, and one of the one of one of the more controversial conversations that we have uh, has to do about the relationship between public schools and private schools and towns and where they're sending their students. And so I was wondering if you could shed some more light on. Uh, just your thoughts on privatization of schools and, uh, and and what you see 
uh, in the future uh, regarding that ecosystem in Vermont? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Vermont's very unique in being a tuitioning state. Um, so I, I have not worked in a state um, that does have this particular um, education ecosystem established, um, and it is so it's something I am learning. Um, my understanding is that um, this interdependence really emerged as a way to ensure that every child had access to a public school option. Um, and in some portions of our state, I think particularly in the Northeast Kingdom and some areas of the southern part of Vermont, um, we do not have a public school option in a town, in which case uh, students would be able to have access to an independent school. Um, so in, in having conversations, it does seem to be that there is an interdependent uh, relationship um, with our independent schools. Um, and so do you have any thoughts on how that may grow or change in any ways, or is that an area that uh, you, you plan to just focus on learning more before um, policies or proposed legislation? Yeah. So I think what I have seen is the legislature really um, has passed a moratorium on um, opening a new independent schools. Um, I also know that there has been um, some uh, really significant and important work around um, ensuring that uh, there is no discrimination, discriminatory practices around enrollment, uh, particularly if there is a parochial nature to the independent school. Um, and so I do think those are, are, are two things that um, the state has been very proactive and supporting to make sure um, that where these independent schools schools are part of the ecosystem, uh, that they are operating and, and, and really adhering to kind of the values of Vermont and, and providing a, a, an educational quality um, that's equivalent to, to public schools. Um, I, I think for, for my question as I look at the education ecosystem is, you know, the questions around why parents and students are choosing schools, right? Um, and I, I think that's a health, healthy conversation to have um, and one that I've had in many areas that I've been in to really help to promote the great programs um, that are going on in schools and and uh, to really strengthen uh, the interest and the awareness of those programs, I, I think is really my first priority um, of, of really being able to strengthen and build up um, our public schools. Thank you. A follow up, Senator Hashim? Uh -huh. Senator Hewlett. Mine is a bit of a follow up to okay. Senator Hashim's question. So, um, in terms of the, our landscape here in Vermont, do you think that private schools that receive public dollars? should have to follow the same rules that apply to public schools, and if not, why not? Yeah, I think it's very important that we have accountability to public dollars. Um, and so my understanding is that the students that do attend these schools are, are required to also participate in the state assessments, and I think that's important to, to ensure that there's a high quality of, of educational delivery. Questions, please, Senator Meeks. I'm sorry, Senator Peele, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, maybe later. Okay. Okay. Senator Meeks. Um, thank you, and again, welcome. Uh, in your position as the Vice President of Strategy at Charter Schools USA, your company <laughs> educated almost as many students as there are in all of Vermont. Yes. Uh, this background makes constituents, our constituents, uh, nervous. Um, I'm wondering, what did you learn there, and how does it frame your view of Vermont's public education system? May I ask a follow-up question just so I can answer the question appropriately? But what about that makes people nervous? Charter school. Oh, oh, not the size. Not <laughs> that's the all, size. just the concept. Not the size, okay. Yeah, that's correct, not yes. the size. Um, so, so really, I, I think the, the focus is on what I've learned in that experience, that I, I think skills that are transferable to this role in the state of Vermont. Uh, so as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, I oversaw schools across seven states. Um, and so, you know, in my position, I was trying to ensure that every school had high quality and consistent outcomes. Um, and we had to make sure we were mindful of the different state accountability frameworks, different state policies, state requirements. And so what that required was really being able to establish those quality standards while allowing for that local control, which I think is very relevant um, to the situation in Vermont, um, where our towns are very involved um, in, in really advocating and um, you know, influencing decisions on the ground. Um, so I have experience in being able to kind of establish those, um, you know, core um, core initiatives that uh, really help to, um, you, know, um, you know, elevate the standard while allowing for customization. So I actually think that's a real strength that I bring, that I've had that experience in working in a very complex system in a distributed environment um, that has many parallels to how the state of Vermont is structured in terms of their geography and local control. Um, also was able to work uh, very closely with our schools and ensuring that 
um, academic needs were driving budget decisions um, and uh, re-engineered the, the budgeting priorities process to ensure that that occurred. I think that's very relevant also as we're having conversations around um, how the sustainability of our system moving forward and ensuring that we're promoting equitable learning opportunities. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. So you welcome. You've uh, Vermont is a very diverse uh, area. Got uh, a lot of nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, problems that are typical in Vermont: or lines of communication, uh, getting there. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't get there from here. There's a good saying you're going to hear it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's going to take some special kind of leader to pull it all together. Can you explain your st particular style of leadership mm -hmm. you think is going to help you? Thank, thank you for that question. And practically speaking, I've been told to be able to print out my map quest when I go places so I can <laughs> right. get to the right place yeah. on yeah, time. Don't use, so, don't use Google Maps. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the question around my, my leadership style. Um, so I've used um, StrengthsFinder with Teams, and I find that to be a helpful tool. And, and what it helps you identify are what are the naturally occurring talents that you have um, to help you to lead a team, and then how you bring in people who have other talents to complement that. Um, and so I think overall, that's my style of building a team uh, where we are really um, leveraging each other's strengths and working in a complementary way. Uh, but when you look at my, my strengths, uh, my first is vision. Um, and that's really, um, you know, establishing a very long-term vision around what we all want to achieve. And I find that bringing that into team meetings and conversations is critically important uh, to keep people focused on what's important and also to keep them motivated um, around what we need to do for our students. Um, and my second strength is strategic. So being able to take that vision and think tactically around how to implement strategies in a way that's going to help us all work together to achieve that vision. Um, a third strength of my leadership style is I'm a learner. So that's going to be particularly important for me as I take on this new role and a new state um, and getting well versed on the policies and the intricacies um, of your uh, state system. Um, and another strength I have is an achiever strength. And so I think that's also very important because what it helps me to do is to see the long-term vision, uh, but then establish those strategies that are gonna help us to achieve some short-term success while we're planning for um, that longer-term vision 10 plus years down the road. Um, so I bring, I bring those strengths um, as I build team and I work intentionally to identify um, uh, the team member strengths so that we can bring them on board um, to, to complement um, and strengthen our overall work together. Just a follow-up. Please. So I've been here for two years in the education committee, kind of looking from the outside in at the Agency of Education. And what I see is a very diverse, uh, talented group of people. Uh, and they, they need some glue to bring them all together. Do you have a focus on where you're going to start? So thank you for that question. Uh, so as part of my onboarding, I asked um, every division manager to provide me with some transition documents. Um, and within that, um, I asked them to share what their previous accomplishments were, uh, what challenges they see ahead, um, to outline for me where are some of the compliance requirements um, that are upcoming that we need to make sure we, we meet the mark on, um, and also what type of field support are we currently providing. Uh, so right now, by the end of next week, I'll have the opportunity to meet with every uh, division team, and what we're doing is really outlining those immediate priorities so that I can create a comprehensive uh, schedule and calendar of, of the major milestones that we need to be tracking. Um, building into that, I will be um, structuring in some uh, really strategy and visioning sessions um, so we can think about how to build on, on the work that we're doing um, while helping to propel um, planning for the future vision of education in Vermont. So I had a question about collaboration and uh, wondering again sort of the question about some evidence if I were to point to public school sort of experience and commitment. Tell me a little bit about proven commitment to collaboration with other groups, organizations, nonprofits, school personnel. Yeah. And so, some specific examples would be great. Sure. Uh, collaboration has been a constant in my work. Um, and I have found that by bringing uh, people around the table, we can do better work together and we get the best ideas um, around to, to move things forward. Um, I'll share a couple of specific examples. Um, so when I was at the uh, city of Fort Lauderdale, uh, we were addressing, as 
people were across the country, the challenges of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and we were seeing significant learning loss. Uh, just within our city, we had 7,000 students that were not meeting adequate annual progress. Um, I was able to work with our commission in drawing down $1.5 million of CARES Act funding uh, to develop a summer um, enrichment program. What I did with that was making sure that we were developing our program intentionally in a way that could serve more students and invested dollars where they were needed most. So I brought together um, Broward County Public Schools, Children's Services Council, which is another um, government entity um, that provides funding to our nonprofits and our, our nonprofit organizations. And I asked each of them as part of that first session, what summer programming are you able to provide with the funding that you have? And then what we were able to do is identify where there were gaps. And that's where I was able to locate the funding that we had from the city of Fort Lauderdale to make sure that we were addressing um, the needs of, of students who otherwise would not have been met. Some considerations uh, that I brought into that process was thinking about the needs particularly of low-income students and working families. Some programs had funding to only offer a half-day program. And that wasn't going to work um, for many of our families. So what we ended up doing was I, I developed a very um, a complex program where we had some uh, program dollars that were allocated to providing that aftercare support for the school district that offered a half-day program. So now those students that really needed the most highest level of academic intervention could have a full-day program, and those parents that were working could take advantage of that. Then we were able to take um, our, our Parks and Recreation program that served thousands of students and be able to build in academic enrichment programming for those students. And subsequently also partner um, with some other nonprofits that did not have a contract uh, to offer services in some areas of our city that really needed it. Um, and so that just is an example of when I brought people around the table, we were very intentional around understanding how we could um, leverage the dollars in a way that was not duplicative but really built upon the strengths of the partner organizations um, and funnel dollars in a way that was going to be most impactful for students. No, please I, go ahead. Okay. Keep, keep going. So that's one example. Yeah. Um, another example, when I was um, driving school improvement planning um, for across multiple states, um, we were working with our principals and classroom teachers. And the process of planning and data collection and analyzing can, can be quite onerous and quite time consuming. And so as part of that planning process, I was able to, uh, to, to sit with our teams and, and identify what some of the uh, challenges were and being able to do that in a more efficient way. So what we did was actually worked in collaboration to develop a school improvement planning platform that provided integrated goal setting from the student's personalized learning plan to the teacher's classroom goals to uh, the student goals um, and all the way up to the regional goals. Um, and that was quite helpful in being able to create that alignment. But the real additional value of that was um, a way for us to be able to capture what was working well across our system so that we could share those best practices um, to support teachers in classrooms in different states and different districts um, and supporting the learning outcomes. Um, and that was a very collaborative effort that involved um, you know, our, our principals, our classroom teachers, um, multiple departments, including um, you know, IT and education and innovation and data reporting um, to bring that all together. And then part of the alignment that we created with that as part of the collaboration was to ensure that now that data reporting helped to uh, provide transparency and accountability to our school boards. Um, and so they were part of a, the collaboration as well in terms of identifying the data points that they thought would be important for them to see on a regular basis in, in terms of ensuring their, their duties. So I do have a follow up and that's regarding, you meant, referenced it a little bit, uh, working with families and students in poverty. I don't really know the Fort Lauderdale community at all. Um, and uh, so could you just say a little bit about those experiences and, and any work you've done? It, it, just maybe elaborate on the population of Fort Lauderdale, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just to give me a, a clear picture of. Sure. Um, so the city of Fort Lauderdale is comprised of 180,000 residents, um, and it's um, very divided in terms of um, areas of very concentrated affluence and wealth and areas of concentrated poverty um, that largely are aligned to the patterns of redlining um, and uh, unfortunately very correlated uh, with race as well. And we have um, some of the areas of our city uh, were experiencing the highest poverty rates in, in the entire state. 
Um, and so my work in coming to the city was ensuring that we were providing um, the, the support um, and advocating for resources um, for those schools and those communities and working in coordination with the neighborhood associations and also with the local uh, community leaders in those areas, again, to identify what are their priorities for education. Um, I was struck by an early conversation I had uh, was a community activist where I naively said, what are we gonna do to get people more involved? And the response was, we are involved and no one's listening. And I, that really um, t struck a, a chord with me and, and showed me the importance of the role of government in helping to amplify the voice of the community. And even if they're not able to show up at um, commission meetings or public forums because they're working multiple jobs that we're being intentional about championing those improvements that are going to be most important um, to the communities and finding ways to connect with those communities and meeting with them where they are um, and when they're available uh, to share that information about what is most important to them. Um, and so in that work, I really brought the lens of equity to everything I did as the chief education officer at the city of Fort Lauderdale. We had $12 million in parks bond funding that we were able to invest in improving school playgrounds. And I, I worked intentionally to develop an equity index so that we actually invested more dollars in those schools in those areas that had higher needs. Um, I also advocated strongly for facility improvements. Some of our um, um, historic and legacy schools that um, had, had been um, underserved um, it was successful in working with the community and looking at the data and being able to substantiate the need to get unanimous approval from the school board to invest additional million dollars in, in improvements um, in those areas of our city. Um, so it, it's, um, it's certainly the, the North Star that I have in my work. Um, and outside of the city of Fort Lauderdale, I've worked in other um, you know, communities. I, I mentioned my work in Nashville, Tennessee, where I worked with the largest um, public housing community. Um, in the city. I've worked in inner city Chicago, in downtown Miami, and rural Louisiana. I've worked in a lot of different places that are um, you know, grappling with the challenges that come with poverty. And I think in every instance it's around how do we make sure that we're providing those extended um, systems of support um, and working with community and partners uh, to be able to create that, um, those services for children and families. Thank you for that. Senator Gillick. Yeah, I have two follow-ups and then a brand new question. Okay. Um, first follow-up, just regarding what you uh, said about the $1.5 million in the uh, drawdown money from COVID. So curious about that summer enrichment program. Did it continue after the money yes. dried yes. up? The federal really money? proud of that. Yes. Yeah. So for three years, we were able to implement that program, and we saw um, really uh, great success. Um, on average, students in the program um, mastered two or three more skills in reading and math during the summer months. And so because we were successful, we were actually able to um, uh, apply for appropriation from the state of Florida um, and were awarded an additional $700,000 to um, continue the program and even more importantly, expand it so that it could provide after school as well so that we actually had a continuum of educational support for our students and we added an additional programming um, related to workforce training and um, navigating college and career opportunities. Awesome, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, back to, I, I wanna make sure I get the, an answer on, um, do you think private schools that receive public dollars should have to follow the same rules that apply to public schools? I, was it a yes or a no on that answer? So I, my, my answer was around the accountability piece is very important. So I think accountability um, you know, to the educational outcomes is, is absolutely important as we look at public dollars and sharing those. Okay, so, so outcomes are more important than necessarily whether or not they follow the same rules. The outcomes are what drive your decision. Yeah, so that probably is a more nuanced question than I'm able to answer at this moment um, because I, I have not yet had an opportunity to do that side-by-side -side comparison. I think that you're referencing where I think what you're um, alluding to is that there, there may be specific rules. What I do know is that at the State Board of Education meeting that I attended um, last week, um, they were reviewing both the 2000 and the 2200 series and ensuring that we did do a, a lineup of uh, definitely ensuring that there was equity, equity and quality um, on both of our standards. So that's what I'm able to answer at this time, but certainly um, based on your question, I would imagine there'll be further research that I need to do. Okay, um, great. Um, and the I have another follow-up. Please, no, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 
and another one that will come later. Um, I'm wondering, so I have over 300 emails from concerned constituents from all over the state who are extremely worried that um, you not only don't have experience as a classroom teacher, but you also lack experience as a superintendent or a principal. Can you point to specific experience you have implementing state and or federal policy in the school district? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so first I wanna acknowledge that. Um, and so, um, you know, I know previous um, secretaries of education have, have taken more of a, what, a traditional path of progressing from a teacher to a principal to superintendent. And I think that pathway is very valuable and I think it provides important insights. Um, my path that I chose is different and I think gives me a very broad view of education, as, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, a very diverse understanding of the factors that contribute. Um, to student success. But in terms of my work in public schools and, and, and doing some of what you said, I, I was responsible for um, managing $25 million in grants and federal and competitive grants, both on the pre and post award side. I was responsible for ensuring accountability to the performance metrics. I mentioned uh, my work around school improvement planning, um, but also if there was any um, engagement we had to do at the state level, um, I was involved in that as well to make sure that we were complying uh, with those requirements. Um, I have experience in developing standard operating procedures to ensure that operationally um, we have our, our alignment around how we're doing our work, both on the, the financial side as well. Um, I have experience developing budget budgeting cycles, and I mentioned earlier that um, I was able to quickly identify that we were out of step in terms of how we did planning and budgeting, so that what occurred was by the time we were doing planning, the budget had already been set, and so I was able to re-engineer that process to make sure that the academic needs um, are driving the budgeting decisions um, for schools. Um, so I think those are very uh, applicable examples. I worked closely in developing um, curriculum around social emotional learning and working with our schools and implementing that. And I found what's been really important in that effort is to identify early champions in helping to craft the approach. And when we're doing the pilot um, for to get input from uh, the classroom teachers about what's working and what's not working. Um, so I have those experiences I think are very relevant um, and applicable and aligned to the questions you're asking. OK, yeah, I would just posit that managing grants is quite different from implementing state and federal policy and um you know the you know title one title nine idea ea have you implemented any of those federal policies at state levels no i have not worked at a state level before okay thank you it's not a shame thank you uh, so one form of collaboration that happens between uh, at least this committee and the aoe is you know, we often get policy recommendations or legislative suggestions um, uh, for, for things that we for things that we can work on and and I don't want to make assumptions but is that something that you would be willing to continue uh, into the future yes I think the Agency of Education takes a leadership role in working with the General Assembly um, to provide guidance on policy decisions. Um, I see our role as being multifaceted and both you know, analyzing the data to be able to give the General Assembly important information to um, direct your decision making and also to researching policy um, that could be informative to the discussions that you're having um, around the applicability in our state. So I absolutely see that um, the, the agency plays a really important role in that and I'm excited to, to take part in that. Thank you. And, and just a follow up to that. Uh, so let's fast forward and you know, let's say it's January of next year, we're in the next legislative session. Um, you know, based on what you've learned so far, do you have any thoughts on uh, just a couple of potential policy or legislative suggestions that you would want to bring to this committee or, uh, well, I don't have to mention the House committee, but, but or to this committee? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, a question that I've been asking everyone I meet with is, you know, a year from now, what do you hope we'll be celebrating together? Mm -hmm. And that's really how I was able to co compile the themes that I shared with you in my opening remarks. Um, one thing that has been really consistent is people want to see a year from now that we've spent the time working together collaboratively to have difficult conversations, analyzing the data, coming up with a unifying vision. Um, and I think that unifying vision 
um, is, is encompassing of a number of different policies that you're currently exploring and will explore um, related to education finance, related to education quality, facilities, enrollment. Um, I think it really is important to, to align that under um, a unified set of priorities um, so that we can, can stay focused and, and organized in, in getting that work uh, through the finish line. Thank you. It, I'm not, would, would you be able to dig a little bit deeper into what potential policy suggestions uh, you may have uh, for next year, even just one or two, uh, like for specific legislation or specific policies that we have in place? So I, I think what I've been pretty consistent on in my approach that I think is really important and, and I, I want to honor is that we really need to do this in a way that is engaging the community, is allowing me to spend more time in, in analyzing the data. Um, in every role that I've played, I've been very data-driven, and I, I think it... Um, it might be um, you know, a little out of turn right now, given I'm only a week in the role to give you some concrete policy recommendations. Um, I will come to you, certainly, um, when I've had that opportunity to really do a deeper dive. Um, and I plan within the, you know, the next 100 days to really do that deep work of listening, learning in the community analyzing the data, um, evaluating the you know, existing policies or a new recommendation so that I can be effective um, in, in really providing you with a more robust policy recommendation um, that, that could be effective. Thank you. Senator Williams. So we've heard a lot about uh, problems with mental health in our yes. schools. Um, and I've also had constituents come to me and complain because they were uh, you know, they were hired to, to deal with those problems, and then they were let go because of funding. Um, what kind of a priority do you see that as, uh, getting people that they can deal with mental health problems in our schools? So as I as I mentioned, that has come out as a as a key theme in my conversations I've had this week. Um, is that there are growing mental health needs for our students. So I, I come to you with a lot of experience um, around uh, supporting students that have experienced trauma, um, and I think it's really important that we think about how to do that well here in Vermont. Um, I can share examples. Just um, recently, we had a student that. Um, committed suicide um, at a high school campus. And um, I was able to mobilize a number of um, mental health support resources um, for the entire student body and the community. And didn't stop there, but thought about, you know, how do we now move to conversations around prevention and building connectivity between our schools and our healthcare providers. I had a similar experience, unfortunately, where students um, experienced a homicide and they were bringing that trauma to school. And many of the kids were getting in trouble at school and were being suspended. And I learned about it through one of our trusted um, community partners on the ground who called me and said, we have to figure out a way to, to manage this because now that the kids are getting suspended, um, there's more risk of them you know, being in unsafe situations. So I was able to effectively bring together the police department, the school district, the mental health providers, um, to address that immediate need and we were able to talk to the principals and say were you aware you know that these students had witnessed um, this horrific event and they had not been aware once they were aware they were able to provide the support that those students needed so after we were able to address the immediate concerns with those students we came back around as a team and we said you know how, how do we prevent this from happening in the future so we were able then to move into a space where we could actually share um, data in our, in our community. We have what's called Shot Spotter, which actually keeps data where a gun a shot goes off everywhere in our community. Um, and that information is helpful for our school principals to know and be aware of. And then figuring out how we actually have memorandums of understanding with the community health providers that can be ready um, to support and respond and provide individual counseling for those students. So I bring a lot of experience um, in, in managing very complex um, mental health um, challenges that are both unique and individual to students and are part of a larger and complex community challenge. Um, and uh, I really want to understand how to be of support in addressing the mental health challenges that I'm hearing about in Vermont. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Um, so a moment ago, uh, you were mentioning uh, that you're hope you're wondering or you're hoping that you'd have celebrations a year from now on achievements and what have you. 
But I'm going to take you, I'm going to expand the scope just a little bit further. My constituents really want to know if the governor gave you a mission for this job, and if you and the governor share a vision of where you think Vermont's public education system might be 10, five to 10 years from now. So yeah. a little beyond the one year perspective. Thank you, I appreciate that. I like the longer term vision, so I appreciate the question. Um, so I mentioned in my opening remarks, what um, really inspired me about this role was the opportunity to support the state of Vermont in creating this continuum from early childhood education all the way to career. Um, my research training and my work as a practitioner have been around creating that system of cradle to career support. Um, I research indicates that that is a very powerful way um, to address the kind of the social determinants and economic determinants of, of academic success um, and can really be a game changer in terms of creating opportunities not only for individuals but to promote broader economic prosperity for an entire community. And, and that's a vision that really inspires me. And I, um, I bring experience in um, you know, articulating that vision and helping to intentionally design systems that include um, you know, creating shared alignment, policy alignment, um, data sharing, uh, process and training support uh, for us to do that in a way um, that is going to be effective and yield the desired outcomes. Um, you know, so often we see kids are entering um, kindergarten and they're not ready. Uh, for kindergarten based on the screener. Um, and that really sets them up for challenges within um, their academic career early on. And so I believe very strongly in the importance of early investment. I'm very proud of the state of Vermont for having universal preschool. I think that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, and I bring experience in trying to connect all of the different systems that support children with keeping you know, public K-12 as the strong foundation of that, um, and then integrating the different um, systems of support um, that the children um, you know, navigate throughout their career. Um, and so through that, if we're able to do that, um, we're seeing um, students enter kindergarten ready to learn. We're seeing higher rates of um, uh, proficiency in reading in third grade, um, you know, high graduation rates. And we're seeing after college um, that our students are either matriculating to college or uh, going right into a, a technical training that's going to get them set up for, um, for a great and meaningful career. Um, so we can measure all of that um, along the continuum, and I'm, I'm really excited for that work because I think it's very transformative uh, for a state to take that on at that level. Along those lines, you mentioned career technical education. It's a priority for the governors. Uh, I think it's safe to say it's a priority for this committee. And most Vermonters, I'd say most Americans, are now yeah. sort of rethinking career technical education. And for everybody. So it's the, the student that is, I think, on the college university path and the student who is in. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience with career technical education in Florida. Yeah. Right. I believe in um, giving children early exposure to mm -hmm. different um, career pathways. Um, I'm really proud of Vermont for you know including the personalized learning pathways in you know, seventh grade so that students start to have that exploration around how mm -hmm. their talents and skills and interests might fit into a career. Um, I often hear from students that they just didn't know another job pathway was available, right? So I believe it's very important for us to give that, um, you know, d diversified exposure um, to careers. Um, I've had experience in doing that, um, you know, early on in, in middle school and through job fairs and things like that as early as elementary school, um, and then very um, in a focused way by developing training programs. Um, so the work that I did around aviation was bringing together our technical college, our K-12 system, state college in Broward County, and aeronautical partners to first identify what is the, what is the workforce shortage that really needs to drive the training programs because we need to make sure that there are jobs available. And then identifying the, the training expertise available to develop the program. And we brought in those partners to support with the internship component so that students had hands-on learning experiences. Um, from the time we had our first meeting until we enrolled students, it was six months. And it was a fully enrolled uh, program that continues to be sustained um, and is helping to ad address a critical shortage around aviation mechanics. Um, similar as we look at jobs within the public works sector, um, you know, we, as you, the state of Vermont recently uh, dealt with a large scale flood, um, so did the city of Fort Lauderdale. Mm. And we're continuing to address a lot of those challenges with climate change. 
Um, so there's different needs in terms of um, the workforce and you know, helping us to um, improve our infrastructure uh, to promote um, you know, resiliency. Uh, so with that effort, I was able to also work in partnership with the U.S. Department of Labor through their Good Jobs, Great Cities Academy um, to develop um, a, a program to support um, a talent pipeline um, for those jobs um, that are in high demand. Um, here in Vermont, I know that the Vermont Futures Project has estimated that there's a workforce shortage of 10,000 workers. Um, you know, I'm interested in, in working more closely with that group and being able to understand where we see with specific industries um, where that is so we can be intentional about working within our, our K-12 system to develop those pathways that are helping students to prepare for careers. Um, and I'd love to see them have opportunities you know, in high school um, to, to intern or be pre-apprentices um, so they can get those opportunities to, to learn um, about those uh, careers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Campion. Um, follow up on Senator Weeks' question, and then I have another one. Uh, his question about vision, I would say Vermont is desperately in need of an incredible leader with an incredible vision. I heard you use words like continuum and alignment. I didn't hear a vision. Can you give me one or two examples of the, the vision, not the continuum or the alignment, but the vision that you would bring to Vermont for education. Yeah, so what I was sharing was really the, the methodology that we can really transform our educational delivery in a way that's gonna get us to those excellent quality indicators, right? So really being able, you know, as a state um, to be the leader in terms of indicators like kindergarten readiness, um, literacy in third grade, graduation rate, um, and then matriculation into um, college or into a, a career. I think those are vitally important. Something else I'm hearing about Vermont is really bringing students back to our state. So if they leave the state um, for a, a job or to pursue um, higher education, what are some ways in which we can really entice those students to come back to Vermont and be part of the economy here? Um, and I think that needs to also be part of that broader vision. Thank you. And then my question, if I can find it. Yeah, so affordability. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that the governor talks about a lot, and he talks about affordability a lot in the context of education. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I want to ask, you know, what would you do about the affordability crisis that we have in our state? Um, I have been an educator and I personally don't see a lot of fat in the system. I had to use my own money to sometimes mm -hmm. pay for college application fees for my students and supplies, yeah. you know, classroom supplies. Um, so given that, that schism we have between this narrative about affordability and then the fact that our system doesn't really seem to be all that fat, how do you envision the financial uh, future of our education system? Mm -hmm. I know it's a hard question. But. It's a big question. Thank you for everything you did to support students out of your own yeah. pocket. I, I know that a lot of people do that, um, and I think that's part of educators just wanting to do the best for students. Um, so I, I think affordability is a challenge for education nationally. Um, we're seeing that there are greater needs for students. Um, we saw that before the um, pandemic, and I think a lot of those issues were further exacerbated. Now we're facing, um, you know, the sunsetting of federal dollars with, you know, no longer having access to ESSER funds. Um, and so it, I think across the country, there's a lot of conversation around how do we continue to sustain um, the additional support that we provided um, for students with less funding. Um, and uh, Vermont is grappling with that as well. Um, certainly there is, you know, affordability challenge and that we're looking at, you know, a very um, large increase in, in property taxes. Um, so understanding, you know, how to address that, I think, really takes um, a much more uh, analytical and review of the structure, right, and how we fund education, how we structure ourselves to deliver um, educational um, opportunities and equity across the state. Um, I'm coming from a state um, in Florida that um, really is probably one of the lowest reimbursement investment in students, about 8,000 um, per student. 
and coming to Vermont, which is one of the, the higher spenders, right? And so I think that's a really great place to start because it's showing that we do have a very high investment in education and that we believe in the importance of, of uh, funding our education system. And I think the work that we need to do as we talk about this visioning is to really think about from a student perspective, how are we aligning those resources in a way that's giving every student equitable opportunities? Um, I had a conversation with um, some students that uh, went through the merger. They were in White River Valley and they were very articulate about describing the fact that when they were in fifth grade and there was this conversation around merging schools, they had a lot of trepidation. They had a lot of concerns. They weren't really wanting to join with a rival community school and those type of things. But now that they're in high school, you know, they talked about the fact that they, they have more opportunities and they're grateful that they had more programming opportunities, um, a broader course selection, more electives, um, you know, more athletic programs. And so I think those are conversations we have to have that are centered around how are we best um, you know, uh, maximizing our limited resources to promote equitable um, educational opportunities for students. Um, so I think it's, it's part of a, a broader conversation um, that I think needs to be part of that visioning. It's a hard conversation. Uh, we, we, we talk about it a lot. There are some incredible small schools in our state. Yeah. I was mentioned, I'm sure the committee's tired of me mentioning, my cousins went to Craftsbury Academy, a beautiful little school in the Northeast Kingdom, 100 students, K through 12. Um, but the opportunities weren't there for, for all students. Now, if you're a middle or upper middle class family, it's very different. But for low income Vermonters, it's, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate your early thoughts on a vision. I know it's not a sexy topic. I say it all the time. Literacy is huge. Senator mm -hmm. gulick has been working on it. The committee's been working on it. Prior committee's been working on it. But if we can get all third graders to be reading at grade level, my gosh, that would be a, a, an incredible achievement in itself. It would. It would. Yeah. And, as we, and I didn't talk a lot about numeracy, but I would also look at that, too. Mm -hmm. And as we think about... Um, preparing students for future careers in AI. You know, I mean, we really have to be thinking about that too in education because there's going to be a lot of opportunities um, in these in these future careers that um, I think we need to be preparing them for to be successful. Thank you, Senator Sheen. Thank you. Uh, I think you had mentioned uh, local control much earlier on, and I just wanted to kind of revisit that topic about sure. governance structures and you know, supervisory unions and just the way we have that system set up. It's almost as complicated as our education finance system. And I know I have at least three constituents watching who uh, local control is very, very important to them. And so mm -hmm. I was wondering what your thoughts are, um, you know, potential future vision, uh, and grant, uh, acknowledging that it's still early on, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, future vision about what uh, the governance structures for school districts and uh, best use would look like. Right. So one, I'll start with the fact that I, I believe strongly in local control. And so I, I shared examples when I was at a, muni a municipality within a large school district in advocating for schools that had been underserved in our community. Um, and I think when you're in a very large system, um, some of those unique needs may be overlooked. And so I, I believe strongly that it's important to have community engaged, uh, being able to amplify the, the voice of the community and the priorities for education. So I, I feel believe really strongly in that. Um, as part of my orientation to Vermont, I've tried to visit different types of um, governance models. So I've been able to attend some uh, or visit some of the um, supervisory unions that are largest geographically and some that are single districts, right? Um, so I would say I, I'm still learning about how that structure works, um, but I think that there are ways for us to be able to, to be effective with our governance and, and really be able to bring in um, that local control. Um, but I have to learn a little bit more about what that is before you know, making those type of recommendations. So we have a, uh, you mentioned an after school program. Yeah. And we recently found out and passed a bill on this committee that a uh, significant amount of money was available for after school programs, but it was decided that because of the financial, the way it was financed, it couldn't go through the LEAs, couldn't go through the districts. So it's gone to the to nonprofits that are doing the uh, the after school programs right now, but I believe ALE is is still responsible for managing that money. Um, so there's a there's a disconnect. You know, I think after school programs are important. 
to in, to matriculate into uh, K through mm -hmm. 12. And what? How would you? How would you connect that? Yeah. So. I'm aware that the after-school funding is through a mixed delivery system, so that can either be through the school as the LEA or through a nonprofit. Um, and so I actually have a lot of really concrete experience in this area. Um, so I, working at um, you know a parks and recreation uh, program, we we were able to develop. Um, programming and we worked with the school district um, to really align curriculum and assessments to make sure that we had that continuity. So I, I think there's very clear ways to create that synergy. Um, I think there's good ways to be able to create that cooperation as I shared earlier where um, figuring out how we can you know, analyze who has the, the bandwidth to do the work and how do we leverage the expertise of different partners. So I've had a lot of success in developing cooperative agreements between the school district and the nonprofit partners in ways that create that mm -hmm. academic continuity. I think it's really important that we, we have the opportunity to, to work with students after school and in the summer that we're able to bring in some education enrichment uh, to, to further their academics. I may never get reelected again, but, okay. I, but when after my, the soon-to-be 18-year-olds hear me say this, but I am always intrigued by year-round school, and I really am. Are there, can we expand those kinds of opportunities uh, for kids? We know there's learning loss, right. but there's also the whole social-emotional piece that right. some kids, uh, listen, as a gay kid growing up, it was, if I'd been sort of forced into some sort of social kind of environment, you know, I think that could have been good if it were, does that make sense if it were sort of, hey, everybody's going to this, or everybody's going to that, instead of, I think sometimes back in the day, kids kind of isolated themselves and weren't as social. So I am interested, I'm wondering if Florida has done anything, not on the, and you know, I'm not looking specifically on LGBTQ stuff, but just in terms of the social emotional health of kids during the summer. Right. Um, so I haven't experienced that in Florida with year-round school, and I would be very unpopular to suggest something with my kids. <laughs> too, but um, but but I've done a lot of work in trying to bridge that gap, right? Um, because. It, access to summer school can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a conversation around, you know, how do we make sure that we're having that continuity of learning um, through those critical summer months? Um, you know, there are other models in, in different parts of the country that do um, year-round learning. It's certainly a different um, financial model that would also need to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, and they typically have brought, you know, large breaks that are built in, you know, throughout the, throughout the year. Um, but I think with the existing resources that we have, um, there's opportunities, again, to create that alignment um, with the summer enrichment programming for students and, and making sure that there is that access um, to summer enrichment because a lot of camps can be quite expensive, right? Um, Great point. And Absolutely. And so I think the issue of access is, is how I would approach that conversation Great. and thinking about the way we can leverage the funds we have um, to, to really, um, you know, target the needs of, of the students who would most benefit. Senator, um, sorry, Senator Weeks, and then we'll go over there. Hey, um, good question. So I'm still trying to uh, understand you from your resume and obviously what you're saying here, but in your last position as the uh, Chief Strategy Officer in, in Broward County uh, Public Schools, uh, you, were, you used the phrase reimagining district operations as one of the bullets mm -hmm. of your accomplishments. So what strategy were you working on in that effort and does it apply to Vermont? Yes. So I'll, I'll paint a little bit of a picture to give you a context of Broward County uh, to help you understand the nature of the work. So I mentioned you know, the scale of the district. It serves over 200,000 students. It's also very geographically diverse with over 31 municipalities. Um, so the complexity in terms of engagement uh, with the local municipalities is, is also quite complex. Um, we were seeing uh, decreasing enrollment in many areas of the county. And yet in other areas of the county, we were seeing that there were um, over-enrollment and students um, on a waiting list for certain um, specialized programs. Um, we also saw that there were um, facility needs um, that were not uniformly distributed um, across the district and, and mainly in the higher needs communities, they had more facility needs. Um, and that tied to a lot of the resource issues around, um, around under-enrollment. We also saw that there were not consistent outcomes, um, you know, across the district, right? So all of these things um, really prompted us to evaluate how we can, um, how we would organize ourselves differently in a way, again, to ensure that we're maximizing the limited resources we have 
to drive um, academic um, opportunities for students. Um, so what that looks like is, for example, if you have a program um, that is really successful, uh, so Cambridge was a program that um, many of our students really, um, really valued. Uh, we had pre-law programs, things like that. Is so there an opportunity to add those programs in other parts of the county so that more students can participate in them and you can reduce the transportation cost to get there? Right? So those are the types of intentional things we were looking at around how do we um, ensure that we're providing um, equitable access to those um, programs that really are going to best meet students' interest and prepare them, um, you know, for their, um, you know, prepare them for success in their K-12 system, but also thereafter. Um, we we're also, we're looking at ways that as a district, we could provide better support overall, right? So um, improved um, you know, training for, for our principals, um, better customer service with our community, um, doing a better job of communicating uh, to the public um, about the great things that were happening in our schools. Um, so it, it was a very um, comprehensive approach um, that we engaged members of the community in helping to define. Um, let's all define what the challenges are together. And from there, um, how do we establish those goals of what we want to do different? Um, and really putting that around the lens of what are the possibilities? Um, if we're able to um, you know, make different decisions, um, does that provide greater opportunities for students? Um, and, and that was really the work that, that I was engaged in. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I want to say thank you for um, what you just said about making sure the good stories get out. Because mm -hmm. sometimes uh, it seems as though, with all due respect to the folks in the room, it's the bad stories yes. that get taken up by the media. Yeah. And it's nice to, to, celebrate, <laughs> to celebrate the successes. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I do have, you know, a lot of my constituents are very concerned about the really hurtful education policies that come out of Florida. Um, there many books have been banned. Um, there, you know, the two laws, let's see, um, HB 1557, which was the Don't Say Gay uh, Bill, and then there was a Don't Say They Bill, HB 1069, which really focused on the use of pronouns in schools. I'm wondering, in your time, I know it was a short time um, at the Broward County Schools, but also when you were in working in Fort Lauderdale, for example, did you do anything to kind of either push back against these laws that really hurt kids, or were you able to implement any policies that push back against those? Can you speak to that at all? Yeah. Um, so I, I think really what you're speaking to is there's some conversation. You know, Florida has been in the news a lot around the culture wars, right? Um, and I, I bring none of that um, to, to Vermont. Um, the county that I was in is, is very uh, unique in being um, very uh, progressive and very um, supportive of ensuring um, equitable, you know, equity and inclusion um, in teaching our full history. So with our commission, when many of those laws were being passed, uh, I was working with our, our mayor and commissioners to, to doing the research and um, engaging with the state around questions that we had around those implica implications um, as they get into the, to the schools. Um, in terms of you know concrete work, is it just building off of what I was doing with um, Broward County Public Schools as we're redefining um, the district? I mentioned several times that there was inequity in terms of facility conditions and then outcomes. And when we started having these community conversations, um, many um, uh, uh, residents from our high minority communities were coming to these conversations very concerned that their communities we're going to be disproportionately impacted um, by these reimagining efforts. Um, and in my work, it was really important that I was able to articulate and to clarify that we need to um, bring racial equity into the conversation um, and actually look at our history of where changes had been made. And so I'm, I'm proud that through my efforts and working with our, our teams, we put together a very comprehensive uh, data report that actually looked at, for the first time, uh, where our uh, historically African-American schools were located and began to have conversations around the impact of integration when um, students were uh, bused to other communities, and then looked at those schools that continue to exist that we call legacy schools and evaluating the level of investment um, that we made in them. And so we had a lot of conversations around the importance of um, investing in those communities and recognizing 
that they had been underserved. Um, and so the, I know a lot of the, the policy and the conversation has been you know, really theoretical around diversity and equity and inclusion. The work on the ground that I've been involved with is making sure that we are um, focused on our, our full history um, and that we are very um, nuanced in understanding that and in, in bringing into decision-making processes. Um, and as it relates to you know, support for our LGBTQIA plus community, um, I'm really proud to have worked with um, our, our first openly gay mayor for the city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, he was a big champion of LGBTQIA plus um, community and rights and, and students. Um, and so I, I come to you with that, uh, that work that we were doing in our community. So, Mayor Saunders, do you need a break at all? I have a lot of stamina. Okay, wonderful to hear. Okay. <laughs> but if you do need a break at any point, please I'm let good. us know. <laughs> Senator Sheen. No, um, you're good. Okay. What's, you, your, what's your time for um, I've cleared the evening. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, I think really until, I might the, need coffee until, until, the, committee, <laughs> until the committee is finished with its, its questioning, uh, if I may, I just want to shift a little bit to uh, kind of back. You've talked a lot about pulling down monies through grants, through other different ways. Uh, oh, but frankly, that's quite appealing. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we have massive school construction needs ahead of us. We have a lot of other needs ahead of us. Um, we're a small state and we have limited resources. I'm wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on some of those uh, times when you were able to access funds for particular projects. And frankly, I am very interested if any of them did go to school construction. Yeah, um, the school construction funds were um, actually out of, um, were not a grant funded. That, okay. that was actually out of the, the funding for the school district from reserve funds that mm -hmm. they were able to, to allocate. Um, something that I'm really interested in as I come into this role in the state of Vermont is thinking about how we can work with the federal government to draw down additional dollars um, and working um, in a supportive way with our supervisory unions and districts to ensure that we are maximizing the dollars that we that we are receiving. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of experience in uh, developing you know, those grant utilization reports um, so that we're keeping tabs on how much money we're drawing down so that if we see that we're at risk of having to return funds, uh, we can be proactive in allocating those. So I would say a, a first um, focus is making sure that we're maximizing the uh, existing um, dollars and resources that we have. And then I do think there's an opportunity as we think about um, defining our vision for the state of Vermont for education. We're very unique. Um, and I think if we can articulate a very clear vision and a clear strategy, it will afford us new opportunities uh, to pursue both federal dollars and also um, you know, private foundation dollars who might be really interested in understanding how do we really strengthen education in rural America? Mm -hmm. and what does that look like to achieve those, those high quality results? So that's how I would um, approach it, but I think really it's first, practically speaking, you know, what what uh, data sources, what grant sources do we currently have? Are we fully maximizing them? Um, and then being able to explore what additional resources we might be able to draw down. I, I would say additionally that it's very helpful to work with the business community, um, and I've had success in um, being able to form those strategic partnerships. Um, with businesses as it relates to sometimes sharing um, it, you know, equipment or uh, resources, sometimes um, teaching expertise and also hosting student interns. Um, so that's another area where we can bring in some additional support. Thank you. Senator Kuehl. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, currently, the legal counsel for the Agency of Ed lives out of state, quite far, actually. Um, do you think it's best practice for the state of Vermont to have uh, the, agency, the Agency of Education Legal Counsel living out of state, and will you allow AOE employees to live out of state when you, yeah. well, now that you're in charge? Mm -hmm. So I won't, I won't speak on specific personnel uh, matters, but I'll speak just broadly around, you know, how we're looking, how I'm looking to really build and organize the team. Um, I see that the agency having a really um, important outward-facing role um, and supporting with uh, technical assistance, uh, training um, in, in the field. Um, so I'm looking to you know determine how to balance that in a way uh, to optimize productivity. Um, and you know so far, just in the first 
first week. Um, you know, I've worked to uh, mobilize um, a team, a cross-functional team of AOE staff to be able to support a supervisory union um, right now that has some um, staffing challenges and we're working very closely with that superintendent uh, to be of support and be in the field. Um, so I do think that's an important element as we're, um, you know, helping to promote continuous improvement. Yes. Um, so I took note of your uh, master's thesis, um, <laughs> which was reframing how practitioners think about human service delivery. Mm -hmm. The theses, thesis are often derived from personal or professional uh, interests. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering, what question were you researching there? And is there any application to that, yeah. that effort to the mom? Thank you. At the core of my research was how do we develop the capacity to collaborate? And that goes back to, I think, what I bring as a strength in terms of breaking down silos and bringing people around the table to work cooperatively together to achieve goals. Um, in my experience, when you talk about collaboration, when you first come together, people are excited. There's a lot of optimism, a lot of energy. But it takes a lot of um, tactical work in order to define roles and responsibilities, uh, to create a clear cadence of accountability and communication. Um, and that's a lot of what I studied that I think will be valuable in this role as we're really trying to figure out how we optimize all resources and expertise to support um, you know, educational opportunities for our students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, real teacher shortage in this state. Uh, I feel like teacher education is changing a lot, and so there are, I think, some opportunities with that shortage. In other words, give people an opportunity to try out teaching through mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting credentialed in a different way um, and see if it were to work for them. Uh, and I guess my question is twofold. Um, first, have you been seeing the teacher shortage in Florida? And mm -hmm. if so, what sort of things have been used to address it? Uh, and then secondly, have you had an opportunity to reflect on the te on teacher education programs at all? Uh, we are, of course, in Vermont looking for the best and the brightest and people who want to be here and are excited to be here in the classroom. And I think the research shows that you want to be in that classroom every day. Mm -hmm. That is number one, uh, despite you know, me, you know, students' personal struggles that can reduce a lot of insecurities, it decreases the negative impact, uh, you know, uh, being hungry, mental health issues, all those kinds of things. So I guess, again, teacher shortage in Florida, have you all sort of been addressing or looking at it in any particularly interesting way? Uh, and then secondly, teacher education programs at all, if you've had an opportunity to reflect and review what's happening either in Florida or across the United States. Yeah. So I was, um, was actually meeting with the agency staff this week and asking this same question around how are we helping to um, recruit more teachers to our state. Um, so I understand that there are some alternative pathways that are, are being created um, here and that there, there is continuing to be some increased utilization of that. So I think that's moving in a positive direction. Um, I know the state of Florida um, launched recently a teacher apprenticeship program. I believe the Department of Labor is, is doing that as well as a pilot here in the state of Vermont. I believe in the northern region, correct? Is that? AHS. Oh, AHS, okay. Um, is, is doing that. I, I think that's a promising practice to, to look at and understand how that can help um, to uh, really attract more people in the field. Um, and then overall, I, I do think we need to be thoughtful around some of the other um, barriers to attracting teachers mm -hmm. in terms of housing affordability. Right. Um, I was talking with a superintendent just yesterday who uh, was re recruiting a teacher and was really excited about that teacher coming on board and they couldn't find housing. Um, and I was really impressed that the superintendent went out of her way of really engaging the community, calling the realtors and asking to figure out places where this teacher could live, right? So I, I know that that type of work is happening, but uh, systemically there, there's some work that, that we'll need to evaluate there to ensure that there is uh, you know, affordable and attainable housing um, for teachers to be able to move here to the state. Um, additionally, in terms of other um, areas, I believe we're currently working with UVM um, and maybe some other universities too uh, 
to promote and, and increase that talent pipeline. So I'm, I'm excited to get a little bit of a better understanding of what that looks like to see how we can continue to expand that. And we've also, I, we've had this con conversation a little bit in committee and just something to think about. I don't need your thoughts on it, but are there opportunities during CTE programs to put students to try out teaching? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. are there high school students that might have an opportunity to go and apprentice and try it out? We want people sometimes, in the olden days, I think it's changed, those teacher education programs really, you weren't in the classroom until later. And so the theory and the, the, the academic background stuff was really intriguing, but then you realize later maybe it wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. But to get people in yeah. early, and you know that's what excites them. They're gonna know that, hey, I'm gonna move in this direction. So just, again, something yeah. to, to think about. Yeah, because so I think it's, CTs have sort of closed <laughs> off to, to <laughs> education a little bit. Yeah, I have some experience in Florida with um, an urban teaching program that is um, a pathway that students can pursue in high school. Oh, okay. um, and then they're able to actually teach, um, you know, at the child care centers that are adjacent, early learning centers that are adjacent um, to their schools, which can be quite helpful. So, um, yeah, I think we need to look at a, a diverse array, a range of options to uh, get people excited about the field of education. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, 36 of our state education secretaries or commissioners in the U.S. are former educators. 11 have had some sort of role bolstering public education. Three haven't worked in education. You'll be the only one to have worked for a for-profit charter school management company. Um, how, do, with that in mind, how do you imagine yourself building trust within the AOE? And a follow-up in terms of the AOE, as I think we're the only state in the country that had Title I dollars withheld because of non-compliance. And I think we struggled with um, generally um, student supports and special education uh, policy and law. And so I'm wondering how you're going to build systems within the AOE. So I guess my question is about building trust and building systems within the AOE. Okay, and just sure. a clarification, were you talking about our federal secretaries of education? Yes. They've all had, because I went through, and they've all had teaching experience. No, 36. Of how many? Of, well, 50 and 51 if you include the District of Columbia. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about our national federal secretaries of education, like the Obama State, administration. State, well, right. Sorry, okay, statewide. Because I think they, I don't think they have Right, no, state. Much, yeah, state. Uh, yeah. education yes. experience. So I'm going to respectfully push back on the fact that your assumption that I don't have public school experience. So I have devoted my entire career to public education, and I do have, um, you know, experience with, you know, curriculum development and, and teaching in higher education. But my focus is really on exactly what you're asking, is how am I going to build that system of coordination and support? I bring that experience in a very unique and, I think, extensive way um, that, that others may not have. Um, having been, worked in, in multiple states in complex educational systems and creating this integrated system of support um, is going to be really critical. Um, I've worked in a cross-functional way in every um, point of my career, and I find that um, it's really easy to build trust when you're able to bring people together around that shared vision um, and building upon their strengths and their interests. Um, I'm already seeing at the AOE a lot of excitement around um, working more closely together and, and being very collaborative. And um, really, I think in that effort, uh, you begin to recognize um, individual strengths and their talents. And um, that in and of itself creates a really positive um, energy and excitement. Um, in terms of building trust in the field, it's the same as building trust anywhere. It's being able to um, be present, to listen, and to show that I'm learning about what, what's important to them. Um, and not just learning, but figuring out how to follow through on those priorities that are going to be most important um, to them. Um, so I intend to be a very hands-on Secretary of Education with open lines of communication um, and to ask a lot of questions so that I can do my job better. Thank you. Somewhat along those lines, I, I appreciate the data-driven nature, your, your interest in data. I usually do have a list uh, that the University of Vermont gave me of those schools that, um, based on test scores, which again aren't any everything, but uh, are really struggling. And I would, my interest really is 
for you as the secretary um, and the agency in general to be thinking about more of a hands-on approach with those schools. Really being able to come back to this committee, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to talk publicly about schools that are struggling. And I reckon and we don't want to, but there's right. still ways to get in there and do the work and come back and say that the work is, is being done. If hospitals were misdiagnosing people, it would be all over the news and the papers, and we would be working to address that. And I, again, not, we're not looking to, these are complicated issues, but certainly the more the agency can get into our schools, I think the better. And I don't know historically if they have been, but it doesn't feel right now that they're, and again, uh, that they're in there as much as they really would need to be, and I'm happy to be proven wrong. I've always thought it would be amazing. Back to Senator Gulick's question a little bit. Uh, yes, I do have concern, share the concerns with certain members of the agents, of any agency being remote. But if we have uh, staff from the agency throughout the state, so somebody could get a phone call and say, hey, can you come in and work with us on this? I think that would help schools a lot. I really do. Um, and I, I think I can't speak to um, you know, you know the, the level of engagement that the AOE has had um, in the field, right? I know that we do have um, a continuous improvement team that is working and supporting those schools. And um, we met this week, and I'm excited to go with them on an upcoming visit so that I can understand a little bit more um, about that work. But you know, part of what I need to do too, as as a new leader in this role, is is not to get too hot or cold on anything right away, right? I, I need to understand the perspective of the field. I need to understand the perspective of the agency so that I can um, really work effectively in ensuring that we are structured um, as an agency as a way uh, to deliver on our core, you know, compliance requirements in terms of spending the federal dollars and also to, you know, addressing um, the, the needs of the field. Um, and so through this process, that's really why I'm structuring my onboarding and a twofold approach, which is spending a lot of time in the field, spending a lot of time in the agency um, so that I can, I can help to, you know, um, create that alignment. And I think ultimately what we're all looking for is to make sure that we have a coherent system of support for education um, and really clarifying roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholder groups that are involved in education. Um, there is so much involvement in education across our state, um, and I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, and I'm looking forward to meeting with all the different associations and stakeholder groups um, to, to understand um, you know, the, the expertise that they provide, the training that they provide, and understand what is the role of the AOE in helping to support um, that work. Um, so I'm excited about that, uh, but I, I really believe it's important to stay as connected as possible um, to the field because it's going to help us to do our work better. Uh, Senator Gillett, my Senator Lewis. <laughs> so, thank you, Chair. Um, getting back to the beginning of our discussion today, which was around charter schools, um, and you've reiterated a few times that charter schools are public schools. Then we asked the question, how do they differ? And you said governance structure, I believe, and um, a kind of lottery system for entrance. Do teachers have to be certified in? Yes. They do. The same certification. Yes. And similar if there is a, you know, out of field waiver would apply for a charter school teacher and a public school teacher, and they would have to follow the same requirements. And there's an approval if they're out of field that the board is required to, to make. Okay. But they're not governed by like a, an elected body, like here in Vermont, we have school boards where people are elected. It depends. Um, de depends on how it's structured. So some uh, public charter schools, um, their teachers are part of the union and some they are not. It depends on how it's structured. Senator Weeks. No, I did not. Have oh, you did not have Thank you. Just a softball question. <laughs> so I had an email last night from a constituent who said that I don't know where he got his data, that the student to teacher ratio in Vermont was 4.3 to 1. So we have a certain capacity within the state of Vermont through the Vermont State Education. Uh, Vermont State University system and the University of Vermont to create our own teachers, but we need teachers now. So would you take a look at uh, how you know how far out we can it's gonna take about six years to get a to get a teacher qualified in Vermont. 
in the meantime, we need to bring teachers in from the outside. Uh, it's just like anything else, a contract, you can't get them. We don't have, when they get here, we don't have a place for them to stay. So what would your, what would your plan be, be part of your vision to create from within? Right. Um, so I think the agency is, is doing some of that already. And, and I was meeting with staff to understand the different pathways that teachers can uh, become certified, both um, by transferring their certification from another state, um, you know, having, um, you know, some of the um, alternative pathways to getting um, certified and also the apprentice, apprenticeship program um, that I know is going to be piloted here in the state. So I, I think some of that is underway. And I think part of what I need to do first is, um, you know, analyze the um, utilization of those programs um, so that I could make recommendations on what, what else may be helpful um, as we pursue that real challenge of the teacher shortage. Can I correct my colleagues' uh, data? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, and I tell no, I said it was 10 to 1. It was anecdotal. Yeah, 10, 10 to 1 based on. That was in my emails. Well, I yeah, yeah, I just don't want anybody. Okay. 4 to 1. It's pretty, it's pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Senator Kuehl. Uh, Senator Schumer, you good? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, Senator Kuehl, please. Sure. I, I, I hadn't written this one down, but it just came to me because I had a conversation over the weekend with a friend who um, works with refugees in Vermont, and we have some refugee resettlement mm -hmm. towns. Um, according to folks who work closely with um, new arrivals to Vermont, they lack linguistic support, mental health support, transportation, food, mm -hmm. housing. I mean, just a whole host yeah. of issues. A lot of times they come with trauma. They've been in... Um, you know, in areas that are extremely dangerous and um, they've had some horrific experiences. What would you do, um, or what could you do, I suppose, in your role in the AOE to support our, our refugees, our new Vermonters here in the state of Vermont? Yeah. So first, I'd, I have some questions around what type of support is available. Um, when I was living in Nashville, Tennessee, that was also a place where a lot of refugees were resettled. Um, and in that context, Catholic Charities was very involved in helping to provide that type of support. Um, is Are they a similar organization operating in Vermont that is providing that connectivity? Yes, my sense okay. is there are some really great nonprofits that are very helpful initially, okay. and, but then yes. over time, um, you know, they can't give the supports that are necessary. Um, sure. And I don't know if that's because of um, workforce, they lack the workforce, or if it's financial, but mm. that those are, these are the anecdotes that I hear right. often, is it just doesn't, it's not enough, and it's not enough time. Right, and it's it's probably falling on the school, right, to, to be mm -hmm. of support. Um, so I think in, in that scenario, it's really being able to spend time in your part of the state um, to understand those issues and, and to work with the schools that are supporting um, our refugee students to um, identify how we can provide a you know, more you know, comprehensive case management and, and what resources are available uh, to do so. Um, so I, I look forward to spending more time so I can understand those issues and, and think about how to navigate them and also ask questions around the um, the nonprofit organizations that are currently providing services uh, to understand if they um, are aware of the gap, right? So sometimes they might provide services and and do um, and, and feel like that transition has been smooth. It might be helpful uh, to have that debrief with them to identify where there um, are um, continued needs, um, so that we can you know work in a way to, to address those. But I'm glad you brought that up as, as an issue that I need to pay attention to. Important one. Secretary Snyder, do you have any questions for us? Um, no pressure. I mean, you, you, uh, in, I want to make sure the committee has also answered all their questions, but I thought I would right. just shift for a moment to you to see if there's anything outstanding uh, at this point. You've been on the road, you've s started to see uh, the Vermont land, educational landscape. Anything right now? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the, the question that I shared, I've asked with everyone, I'd, I'd like to ask with the committee, right, as we think about a, a year from now or maybe even 10 mm -hmm. years from now, what will we be celebrating together? My retirement from the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Related no. to education. Yes. <laughs> committee, thoughts? Well, I have a thousand thoughts, yeah. but it's not my confirmation here. So okay. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go there. It's, okay. uh, you know, you know, some of us got assigned to the committee without a lot of, you know, uh, professional education background, you know, as far as educators. 
And we certainly, but we certainly have visions. Yeah. Uh, and we're, you know, as uh, freshmen, we're working towards, except for the chair, of course, we're working towards kind of coalescing what those visions really mean and how they affect uh, your agency you know, specifically. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to back to the chair. For me, those those essential skills, uh, going back to literacy, are are everything. Being able to read and write and being excited about it, uh, being able to do it, uh, reach those skills at a grade so that you're not catching up always. Um, and the other piece, I mean, I would agree with, this, with Senator Weeks, there are a lot of things we could talk about, but the social emotional health of our students right now is, uh, I know, at the forefront of all of our minds. How can we keep students engaged and excited about learning, which will translate to so many wonderful things. Uh, so those are a couple of things for me that are front and center. Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with Senator Weeks that there's we have a lot of ideas and visions. We were both on the school construction task force, so yes. we have a lot to say school about construction. school yeah. construction. And, um, but I guess I, it, I just feel, I mean, I said it before, we need an incredible leader with incredible vision. The AOE, um, I, I feel, um, is, I think it's safe to say, is struggling right now. Um, it, they're loaded with incredible people. There's incredible mm -hmm. talent in that agency. Um, we know many of the folks who, who work there, um, but it just feels as though they've lacked that cohesive uh, leadership. So um, that's really what I would want to see a year from now, two years from now, is that they are the best that they can be because of um, a, a leader that's brought them together. I can say I'm, I'm very excited to work with the agency staff. It's um, It's been really a, a fun part of this past week is uh, just really being able to engage with them. And there's so much enthusiasm for the work that they do. And, um, you know, they, they got to this role at the state level because they care so deeply, right? Um, and they really want to be part of this broader conversation around what is the vision for, for education. Um, and I, I think, too, this is the opportunity to talk about roles and responsibilities, right? Um, so that everyone's clear and that we're all growing in the same direction. So um, I, I'm excited to, to, to lead the agency and, and work with a talented group of people that um, you know, I think are, are really excited about the work. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention a, it's kind of a tie between two things. I mean, first, uh, with Senator uh, Campion mentioned the social and emotional health mm -hmm. of our kids. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of the agency and the legislature, I mean, for, for me, Clear, consistent, and reliable communication is okay. really the most important, um, especially after this last session. Uh, I just really want to be able to have straightforward conversations so that we can develop the policy. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I guess that's, I, I hope that's something that we can celebrate a year. Yes. To get to your question. We'll bring cupcakes. <laughs> Maybe other questions you might have. Center Weeks, Senator nope. Williams, Senator Sheen, Senator Dulek. I think I'm good, thank you. Secretary Saunders, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. We know if we have any follow-up questions where we might find you, uh, but we very much appreciate you being with us today. Okay. So, thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So committee will take uh, 15 and be back. Thanks. We're off. Thanks. Yeah, how much are, how much are we going to go into it? Why don't we just go around, just have a conversation, you know, yeah. see what people's thoughts are. Our thoughts on the interview or on next steps? Uh, the interview, next steps, all of it. So welcome back, everyone, to Senate Education, Tuesday, April 23rd, 3.50. Committee, we spent a little over an hour and a half talking with Secretary Saunders, uh, wondering impressions, thoughts, timing. What would senators like to do? Anybody want to share anything? She's very composed, like I thought. For, you know, what she done here? Two weeks, maybe? Been on the job, we'll be yeah. I mean, 
having having done that, come into an organization, not really knowing what I was getting myself into. Um, yeah. I thought she responded to the questions well. Um, but she does understand strategic planning, and she knows she needs to have a vision, and I think she wants to build that. But I don't think she's going to come in and start making changes right off. No, I agree. I think she'll get to know, you know these folks. And I, I was impressed by the depth of knowledge <coughs> having been here. I, she clearly has been studying Vermont and understanding, yeah, really looking into things. Um, Senator Weeks, any thoughts? Uh, just said, uh, so there was a question about whether she had worked at the state level before. And, you know, when, when we all go job shopping, we're always looking for the next job up. This, given, given the background of the scale of the school system she's been involved in and the scale of Vermont's public education system, I think that, I think that, that, that this is, um, uh, it's, it's not inconceivable to make that transition. So what, so she's not a prior secretary of education anywhere, of course, right? But I think the scale of her engagement in previous positions was has potentially prepared her well for this position, as far as scale and scope and challenges. Okay. Just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have more of a tendency to uh, ruminate for a bit longer, but uh, you know, I think. You know, my, what, what I would have preferred hearing more on uh, is about specific policy issues. Uh, and yes, I know that she's only been officially the secretary for, what, a week now? Yeah, right. But, but I mean, you know, it's, it's been a longer process than that. And I mean, I, it, yeah, I'm, I, I'm reasonable about it, but it's, you know, I, I, I don't expect her to come in with, you know, like with legislative language to present in her confirmation hearing, but, you know, it's, <laughs> right. it would be good to hear, you know, yeah. what about PCBs, uh, you know, I need you know, thoughts on those, what about our SUs, you know, it, things like that, um, or, or at least a, an indication that, you know, there are specific policy areas that she's identified. Uh, and stated that you know that that's an area that she needs to work on or learn more about in preparation for next year when we come back. Um, so, yeah, that, that 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 was my for me my biggest area. Um, it's it's a position where I think someone really needs to hit the ground running with an understanding of policies that are important to us. And, and our kids, and yeah, that's that's my that's my initial thought. Have you been through one of these with judiciary, not judges, but have you all taken testimony on like a secretary level or commissioner position? Uh, in judiciary, I'm, I'm just wondering. I'm trying to okay. get all been. Pretty sure they've all been judges. Judges. Yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, Senator Gilly. Thank you, Chair Campion. Uh, you all know my passion for education and kids, I think. I can make that pretty clear. Um, this, the person who is in charge of the AOE and who gets, who does this job is in charge of a $2.6 billion fund in our, in our budget, state budget. Kind of. Kind of. Kind, kind of. Let's be fair. Yeah. 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 No, you're managing right. that. Not managing yeah, it, but that, yeah. is overseeing it to a certain degree. Um, and is responsible ultimately for future generations of Vermonters. So it's a big job. It's a huge job. Um, I think Ms. Saunders seems really nice. I would like to have her working here in Vermont. I think we need her. She seems like she's got a really cool background, interesting background. She's intelligent. She's well-spoken. She's poised. Um, I personally am not sure that she is ready for this job, given the crisis that we are in. And this is a crisis that 
I'm not calling it a crisis. It's been called a crisis by many, many, many people. Um, we're in this inflection point. Um, I think we need someone who just has uh, more experience working in public education in schools, um, understands policy, understands systems, understands public school management to a better degree, has a vision. I think Senator Weeks's question about vision was so important and I didn't hear an answer. I didn't get the meat that I wanted there. Um, and that disappointed me. Um, I didn't particularly like, or I, I don't think her answer about charter schools was accurate. I, I will go and do a little bit more research, but I, I just, that's not what I heard her say is not what I understand to be the case. Also, um, what was that answer? Could you remind me? Um, that, that it just depends. She seems to think that charter schools are different depending on geography, and maybe that is true. So I did have a conversation with Lynch Council, and I might advise to talk to them also. Okay. According to Lynch Council, I don't want to be quoted here, charter schools are very different in all different okay. states, all different things. So what's happening now, we use the word broadly, just like magnets and other schools, but they are do seem to be different in different states. Beth, might, you might ask her for a, I think she has the 50 state comparison. Okay. So yeah, I would love that. That would be great. And I also was just didn't love the answer she gave about public dollars for private schools. I mean, that's me personally. So that's where I stand. Um, I'm being very honest with the committee right now. Anybody else? Any other comments or thoughts? Please. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to use my experience. Yeah. I came here not no background in education and it takes you a, a year to figure out what your job is mm -hmm. a year to fig, figure out how to do it and how long is her term mm -hmm. so and she's coming with experience i and we set the policy so i would expect her to come back to to the policy makers and say hey i've got this i got a couple questions uh, this is how the agency's operated or has operated in the past. What's your policy on this? So she should be looking at us as a resource for making improvements in the agency and the state education system overall. Yeah. Uh, you know, everything I got, the majority of the emails I got, they had four points. She didn't have any public school uh, experience. She'd never been a supervisor, never been a principal. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Certainly, mm -hmm. so I, I, so I didn't hear that. Um, yeah, I went through while she was, I went through the questions that the super, some of the superintendents sent us around public education, collaboration, understanding Vermont's uh, education ecosystem. It's early, but I felt two decades, charter schools, public education, proven commitment to collaboration. I might could be totally missing something here, but I left impressed. Yeah. <laughs> other questions? Other things people need answered? The only other if I could just say one last thing, yeah. I, I just want to highlight something that Senator Williams said, which is that we can be a resource to the AOE. I think that's a great point. I feel like we should work together with the AOE and like help each other out as much as possible. I think, and maybe there's ways we can do more of that. Um, I think we can help to narrow her focus. Yeah. So that she can be successful and, and we can be successful overall. Well, and the only other thing is, I, you know, I think at other times in the history of Vermont, when the AOE was in a more robust place, and maybe when we weren't in such a crisis, maybe Ms. Saunders would have, would have potentially been a, a, a good leader. Um, but I, I just feel like given this point in time where things are just incredibly um, 
in need of very pointed health assistance uh, strategy. I, I just, I'm unsure, but um, I will agree with Senator Hashim that I also would like to, you know, sleep on it and think a little bit more on it. So I'm not prepared necessarily to vote right now. Yeah, I would say on the vision thing, I, the only thing I would add is, I don't think any of us have a vision. I mean, we all sort of have a vision, but I think we're about to look at a document outlining the vision. I correct me if I'm wrong, the yield bill I believe is trying to get us toward a state vision. We're gonna be taken through that tomorrow. Um, so I think, I, in a way I'd like her to, frankly, depending, I'm not sure I've wanted, personally wanted her to come in and say this is my vision having been here a week. I would find that a little bit, yeah, personally, yeah. I just don't know if I would want her to you. I mean, she did talk about literacy. I mean, we don't want to talk about vision. Man, get kids to read. That, that's where I would say, yeah. I would, you know, I'd have to say, officially, yes, she's been secretary for a week, but yeah. you know, it's been a months long process where she's, um, you know, it, when, when was it that she was appointed, or you know, the April first, something like that? I'm guessing. Yeah. So it's. I, I mean, it's. You know, it, I mean, she was in the job process, you know, the, the application, the interviews, and so on, longer than just a couple of weeks. And so it's. I feel like there's a length of time in which, you know, you. But wouldn't you want her to engage the field before she talks about vision? Sure. I mean, honestly, so, honestly, push back and tell me no. I'm just thinking, I would want her to come in and say, hey, let's all meet, let's all talk, look at this yield bill, and together do a vision. But feel free to disagree. I'm just curious, because the vision thing is yeah. is big. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I feel like she has been engaged in the field, and, but you know, it's also, it is early on. I, yeah. Like I said, you know, yeah. I don't expect her to come in and say, okay, you know, I've been here a week. You guys yeah. should amend this statute, just so you know. It's that's right. not that's not what I'm expecting. Yeah, but yeah. It's we're yeah yeah we're at a bit of a disadvantage too because we didn't get to, we didn't get to talk to the other eighteen people. So I'm not saying well, that she may have been the best choice, uh, but one of the said I was on natural resources for years. The governor appoints people. Right. You know, yeah. One of the questions so, I, yeah, I was yeah. going to ask her, but I thought it was too softball. Was why did you come to Vermont? I mean, you know, she kind of answered it. Yeah, I was going to ask that also. I didn't think it was a softball. I was looking through some of the stuff that uh, some folks had said on the news. And one person did say, I think it was on Vermont Edition, said, why Vermont? Or, you know, somebody should ask that. And I felt like she addressed that enough for me at that point. Are you going to well, say something? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to comment on, um, I, I specifically asked her a question about the governor's mission mm -hmm. that she if they spoke about her uh, his if if, he, if the governor had put her on a mission like to me that's like focus right yeah which then led to the question of what's do you have to, are you sharing a vision of vermont's education system yeah and i thought it was like you know wide open question could have gone anywhere uh and left me a little hanging uh-huh yeah and i um I'm curious. I, I know. I know. I believe. I believe because I believe the governor's got. Um, he had a, uh, a vision of uh, the next secretary of education. Uh, Ms. Saunders fit that vision, and they have. I, I'd be surprised if that conversation's not happening, but it wasn't shared, and that's unfortunate because we're all dealing with it, obviously with education, and it would be helpful to know where we're going from an executive branch perspective. Oh, the governor's right. conversations and connections. Right. I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is I know she's been at it, sort of looked at for a while. She has been getting paid for a week. She's had to move. Uh, you know, again, oh, no, no, she I hasn't had that. a chance to sort of but, sit uh, down with the guy. But I would, my thought was that, you know, there's some synergy. The governor thought she was the best candidate. Oh, right, she right. accepted the position. She's a education professional and some somewhere that we that story weaves together into what she what you know at least what they uh, um, 
yeah. that we're in here would like to accomplish together. And yeah. I, and I just thought that was, it was just a missed opportunity. So you can always loop back to her, yeah. No, it's in our, in my former life, you know, that would, the vision comes from, from, from your boss. So, you know, in the military, so the commander's intent, his, his vision of what he expects everybody subordinate to him to do. We don't have that subordinate um, organization here, but it really needs to be, she's, she's working for the government. So she needs to, she needs to know what his vision is. And then if, if she doesn't have the resources to actually affect that vision, she needs to come back to him and say, hey, you know, I can, I understand what you want and I agree with you. And I think, you know, these are the things I want to do to make it happen, but we need to do this, this, and this. Okay. Yeah. Senator Weeks. Weeks. No, actually. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much, Senator Weeks. Uh, yeah, I will just very respectfully push back. I, I have never taken a job where I didn't go into it with a vision. Um, that doesn't mean right. I implemented right. my vision. I, I asked for help. I asked yeah. for, you know, colleagueship and collaboration, but I had a vision. And again, this is a job that is very big, very important at a very critical time to come in without a home run vision that can be tweaked and changed depending on the landscape is very troubling to me. So give me an example of what she might have said. Well, what I- She did talk about a little bit, and we wanna go back and read it. At one point she just talked about, for example, you should do A, you know, these are sort of things, but tell me what you're thinking, just so I know. Well, what I heard was continuum and alignment. I heard her mention indicators, graduation rates, bringing standards back. I mean, these are all words that we use in education, right, right. but they weren't put together in a cohesive what would you have loved I'm not command. applying for this job. No, I know. Right. Just give me an example of what vision, any vision. She could have like. talked about school construction. What are we uh -huh. going to do about that? Here's my plan. Boom. She could have talked about how she's going to improve literacy rates. Mm -hmm. She could have been, uh, talked about how she's going to improve graduation rates. Well, um, we didn't ask those questions but either. But that, that would all be part of a vision. Truancy rates. How about <laughs> truancy? That's yeah, all part of a vision. Yes, yeah, so, so let, let me help out my colleague. Yeah. Wow. That's, just, just look. I didn't realize that was funny. I, I would, I would, I would have anticipated that she could have softballed that question with a, in my first hundred days. Yeah. I intend. My priorities are maybe it is to learn about this, this, and this. Or I understand this is the most perplexing problem in the state, and this is going to garner a great deal of my attention. Yeah. Something like that. Priority. I was trying to get at my question as well. Okay. Had three monitors. So I think it was a mess. Yeah. That's what I'm. So the first 100 days, this is what I would do. Um, yeah, to, to address Senator Hewitt's concern, that could have been an easy answer, an easy example of how to address that question. And by the yeah, way, I, 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 take, I, mean, I, I kind of have an issue with my chair laughing at me, Brian. No, I, I, cool. So I apologize, but I do think we have to actually ask the questions if we don't, if we want the answers. We can't he just say He asked it. I asked it a second time. The vision? Yes. I felt like we, no, I'm talking about if you're concerned about truancy rates, if you're concerned about school construction, those should be questions that we should also ask her. But maybe you disagree. Anything else? So what's the, what's the process? What's next? So we, yeah. we take a vote. We take a vote, I would say, when people are ready to take a vote. But I don't think we could put it off. I think we've got to take a vote, I would say, within the next 24 hours. OK, tomorrow afternoon. I would say tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Unless somebody objects to that, I would say go through and read everything. And frankly, I would look at it again and see if you feel like she had answers to those questions. Anybody object to having a vote tomorrow for now? I don't think we'll be any more informed on Thursday than we will be tomorrow. Yeah, and I would just take your time and read through everything. A lot's been said. Um, Listen, there were things said initially about her being from Florida. I mean, all sorts of things. So just take it all into consideration and we'll schedule a vote tomorrow. Morning at work. Anything else? 
Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Morgan.